So tonight we're just going to have a look at, um, a very fairly brief look at some of the signs of the times. We're going to have a look at some of the, uh, to start with some of those prophecies that we think are in the process of being fulfilled and give us the confidence that we believe that Christ's return is not too far away. So we're going to start with a couple of prophecies that I think you know pretty well. Ezekiel 38 is one of them. Um, and we just want to touch briefly on some of the main points. We're not going to expand it in, in depth. Hopefully uh, most of you are fairly familiar with the chapter. Um, but we do just want to touch on a few things that uh, we think are relevant to what's happening in the world around us today um, and how some of these things that we believe are coming together. So what's Ezekiel 38 about? Well, it's... Uh, basically describing an invasion of the land of Israel. So you can see uh, verse 8 there, that uh, the subject of the chapter, uh, who's titled Gog in verse 2, um, is going to come against a land, into a land, as it says in verse 8, that's brought back from the sword, that's get out, gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been uh, waste. So it, this chapter is basically a description of an invasion of the land of Israel, and it's an invasion against Israel, who's a, a new nation brought back from the sword and, and different nations and has uh, been reconstituted in its land. And the invasion's headed up by someone who's titled Gog in verse 2, uh, and he's from the land of Magog, uh, the chief prince. Um, as we know, the Hebrew there is the prince of Rosh, so another um, proper noun there, Rosh, Meshach, uh, Tubal. So Ezekiel mentions all these countries that are aligned uh, with Gog. And then again in uh, verse um, 5 and 6, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, um, Goma and Tagama. So all these nations, uh, ancient nations, get listed out here in Ezekiel 38 as being aligned with Gog. Um, and then we get the people who are opposing them. And the people that are opposing them are listed for us um, in verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof. And they put up this protest against this invasion uh, of Israel. And they say, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away capital, uh, cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? So we've got these two opposing armies meeting in the land of Israel. Uh, one headed up by Gog, and the others are led by those nations that are mentioned there in, in verse 13. And finally, as a result of this, we have God intervening. And that's the, uh, the key uh, thing that comes out of this. Uh, in verse 18, for example, it shall come to us. This, you know, this battle is different to every other battle that's been fought down through history for a long time. At this same time, when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. So God's going to act. Um, and in uh, verse 22, God says, I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood and will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him. So this huge, great conglomeration of an army that's coming to the land of Israel, God's going to destroy them. And overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. And thus, says God, will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. So that's a very brief overview of Ezekiel 38. And if you want to go into any of the detail of how we um, arrive at any of our conclusions, I'm more than happy to speak to you about it afterwards. But we really come down to the idea of these different countries being involved in this uh, massive conflict in the land of Israel. So we've got countries uh, in, uh, in red there, and we've got our general location of these opposing forces. We've got Israel in the centre there in, in, uh, in the orange writing, um, and that's going to be the battleground. Um, and then the nations in red are those that are led or aligned to, uh, to Gog, who's the, the great um, uh, leader of this, this army, uh, in their invasion of Israel. So we've got... Uh, Goma, sort of in the far west of Europe, Magog in central Europe, uh, Rosh in the area of Rosh, Russia, uh, Meshach and Tubal, both sort of occupied by Russia these days, uh, Tagama in sort of Georgia and, and Turkey, Persia in uh, the area of Iran, 
Ethiopia in sort of Eastern Saharan Africa and Libya in, in Northern Africa. So they're the nations, they're sort of modern equivalents uh, that are listed there for us in Ezekiel 38. And they're going to be opposed by the people that we've sort of listed there in uh, blue or, or teal, uh, Dedan uh, and Sheba, sort of in that Arabian Peninsula area, Tarshish, which we've got in the UK and also in the east in India, and the young lions thereof. So if, if Tarshish is Britain, um, we expect them to be joined by their former colonies, being the, the young lions as described in Ezekiel 38. So the USA, uh, Australia, Canada, uh, India and such like. Now you'll notice that in Ezekiel 38, as, uh, as we've read it, the opposition doesn't seem to be that potent. It seems to be more really of a bit of a feeble protest in uh, verse 13. So they sort of say, you know, they're asking questions. What's, what's all this invasion going on about? Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? It's not like a full-blown uh, opposition, um, more just a, a bit of a, a protest against what's happening with this army led by the Russian Gog. Uh, and obviously Gog seems to have a lot more countries under his control than, than seem to be in the opposition. So that's what we believe from Ezekiel 38, that these countries, and that's what we're going to look at tonight, how these countries are going to fall into alignment with each other and perhaps form a coalition of some sort, and how they're going to be opposed by these uh, countries such as the UK, um, Saudi Arabia, um, and perhaps the Young Lions, the USA particularly. So that's Ezekiel 38, briefly. Um, turn over to Revelation and we just want to have a look briefly why we think the papacy is also an important part of this as well. So Revelation chapter 16 and 17 gives us the clues about that. So Revelation chapter 16. And uh, we'll start at uh, verse 14. So again, without too much context here, and we understand that the book of Revelation is really a book of symbol, but it's talking about these uh, three unclean spirits like frogs in verse 13. And it describes in verse 14 as the spirits of devils or demons working miracles or madness, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to a battle. So we're in the right sort of zone here, describing a big battle of that great day of God Almighty. And where does that battle take place? Well, it tells us in verse 16 that he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue. So logically, it's in a land that speaks Hebrew and that uh, the only one these days is Israel. And it's called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So here's how we get the idea that this battle that's being talked about in, in Revelation 16 is the same battle that's being talked about in Ezekiel 38. And in the middle of those two verses, we have that uh, important warning about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So again, we're not going to go into the huge detail of Revelation uh, 16 and 17, but it is important to notice that this uh, is where we get the idea that the Roman Catholic Church is also involved uh, in this battle in uh, Ezekiel 38, or at least the subsequent uh, out outcomes of it. So in verse 19, as a, you know, directly after this, the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So again, we have this idea of God intervening and giving out the, uh, you know, becoming angry, which are described in Ezekiel 38 as well. And here it's talking about God being you know, wroth, being angry, and pouring out a cup of judgment on this city of Great Babylon. So who's Great Babylon? Is it literally the city of Babylon, which, as we know, doesn't really exist anymore? Well, no, it's a symbolic city. Um, which uh, stands for the, um, the Roman Catholic Church today. And we know that from, Ezekiel, uh, from Revelation chapter 17. So in Revelation 17, we see that this Babylon in verse 5, for example, gets mentioned, Babylon mystery, Babylon the Great. So we're talking about the same subject. 
Uh, we read in verse 9 that it sits on seven hills. The seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman who's controlling this beast uh, sits. So the city that sits on seven hills being Rome. Um, it has influence over many nations. Uh, so in verse 15, the angel says to John that the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So it's got influence all over the world, uh, over lots of nations. Uh, we know it's referring to a city because it tells us in verse 18, the woman which thou sawest is that great city. And it's the city that reigned over the world in John's time, which is sort of, you know, AD 100-ish. Uh, and that city, of course, then was Rome. So we're talking about the influence of, right down to our time, the Roman Catholic Church. So when we're looking at the signs of the times, we're sort of looking for those countries that we talked about in Ezekiel 38, sort of coming together to form some sort of coalition. We're looking to them being opposed by the other countries that we mentioned, Britain um, and the USA, particularly Saudi Arabia, those sort of countries. And we're looking for the influence of the Catholic Church in this as well. So the Catholic Church uh, being influential over particularly Europe, uh, perhaps Russia uh, and their allies as well. So putting all these, these two prophecies together, what do we expect to see? So we expect to see firstly Russia and Europe in closer alliance. So we expect to see them either working together in some way, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We expect to see Britain, on the other hand, distancing itself from Europe. So it was a you know, fairly integral part of the European Union there for a few decades. Um, but we're going to have a look at how that sort of separated itself from Europe over the last year or two. We expect to see the Catholic Church influencing uh, European behaviour and becoming, uh, in some way, uh, uh, involved in that invasion that's going to take place uh, that was described in Ezekiel 38. We expect to see closer ties between countries like Russia and Iran, the Persia of Ezekiel 38, and Libya and Ethiopia and all those other countries um, that were mentioned in Ezekiel 38. So we expect to see Russia have, having influence on those countries uh, in some way or other. We expect to see the Western alliance to become weaker, a weaker deterrent in the Middle East. So whereas um, the USA obviously has been a strong force in the Middle East over the last couple of decades, um, we expect perhaps to see that become a weaker deterrent for, to, uh, from stopping a country like Russia invading that area. Um, a couple of decades ago there would have been, you know, we couldn't have believed that Russia could have invaded, they weren't strong enough, but now of course, as the US starts to pull out, um, then relatively Russia is in a much stronger position. And we want to look at reasons for Russia to invade the Levant and, and Egypt, that sort of eastern Mediterranean area. What, what could bring them down there? Um, what do we see in current events that could influence that? So Ezekiel 38 suggests a couple of reasons for the Russian-led invasion. Um, you might remember they talked about if you come down to take a spoil, is it going to be wealth in the form of perhaps energy, um, technology perhaps? Um, if you turn back to Ezekiel 38, we've got that idea in verse 7. Uh, that it may perhaps be a religiously uh, motivated invasion. So we've got the idea um, in verse 7 of a company, and the same word assembled is used there. And often that word in the Hebrew, not always, but often it's used of a religious assembly. So there perhaps has the overtones um, of a religiously motivated invasion, um, a holy war, if you like, or a crusade, and perhaps there's some uh, motivation for Russia in there as well. So what is happening in the world today uh, that sort of falls in line with what we expect to see from these prophecies in Ezekiel 38 and uh, Revelation 16 and 17? So the Russian and European alliance, how's that going to work? Um, most of Western Europe, uh, the big nations, Germany and France particularly, uh, which are essentially the you know, Gomer and Magog of Ezekiel 38, um, 
Well, Ezekiel 38 sort of implies that perhaps they're in a willing. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be willing partners with Russia, but it seems that they are going to be willing partners with Russia in, in that uh, invasion. So how's that going to happen? At the moment, they seem to be a fair way apart ideologically. Um, Western Europe's France and the Germanys are pretty distrustful of Putin at the moment. How's it going to work? Is it going to be an ideological sort of uh, coalition? Is it just going to be purely just military? Uh, is it perhaps going to be economic? Or is you know, European nationalism going to uh, play a part in it? Well, it's certainly uh, the one strong tie that they have at the moment is an economic one. So. Um, this is a map from 2017, which hopefully you can sort of vaguely see. Um, and it shows the gas pipelines from Russia uh, to other parts of Central and Western Europe. And the darker green countries um, are countries that are 100% dependent on Russia for their gas supplies. So obviously it gets pretty cold in most of those countries during winter. And without any gas, um, they're not going to have any heating. Their economies are going to uh, pretty much shut down. So countries like Sweden and Finland, uh, those Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, yes, I remember them, um, they're all sort of 100% dependent on Russia for their gas supplies. Uh, Poland, you know, up to 75% dependent. Germany and Croatia, up to 50% dependent. So Germany itself uh, might seem ideologically like a fairly relatively left-wing socialist country, and Russia is heading way off to the right there under Putin. But economically, they've got a pretty strong tie there with uh, being dependent, um, about 50% of their gas coming straight uh, from Russia through that, uh, particularly that North Sea pipeline that you can see going between Russia and Finland up there. Um, even France and Italy get about 25% of their gas from uh, Russia. So if these countries have no gas, then they have no energy, um, they have no economy, basically. And those dark lines on the map are the pipelines that are coming from Russia into um, Eastern and Western Europe. And incidentally, it really shows why Ukraine is so important to Russia. They've got so many pipelines coming from Russia through the Ukraine into Western Europe as well. So could Russia use their energy power um, over Western Europe as an influence. And their past behaviour certainly indicates that that seems like a, a fairly likely option. They've certainly turned the gas on and off for other countries before um, and used that as a political weapon. But Germany is in the particularly interesting you know, case of being very heavily reliant on Russia for not only gas but also oil. Um, and uh, sort of having to tread this fine line between disagreeing with everything Putin says and does uh, but strongly relying on them economically for providing their, their power. So this is just a graph about who supplies Europe's oil and those, you know, the top two uh, companies are both Russian companies uh, on the left hand side. And so those top two account for about 35% you know, of Europe's oil comes from Russia. And they've got another one down there on the right hand side as well. So this is uh, from 2016, so only a couple of years ago. But you can see that oil is also a big lever for Russia. Um, so two of those top 10 suppliers, or three of the top 10, and two, uh, two of the top are Russian. So energy supply is a key economic uh, area of leverage for Russia. So on the surface, we've got uh, Merkel being sort of politically opposed to Russia. But energy and their economy might drive them together. They're highly dependent on the Russians for um, their energy supplies, and it's really in their best interest to keep that good relationship going. So we don't really know how they're going to come together uh, in an ideological sense, um, but they're definitely already intertwined uh, strongly in an economic sense because of their dependence on Russia for oil. But the ideology may well come from um, <coughs> from the Pope as being the sort of common factor between all of these countries. Um, the EU turned 60 last year, and this is a picture of uh, the Pope addressing all the leaders of the EU nations um, in the Vatican. Um, and that article is from last year, 
um, March 2017, and you've got the title there uh, that the Pope Francis says the EU risks dying. He's called for greater European solidarity as an antidote to the modern forms of populism. So um, at that meeting, there was uh, prime ministers and presidents from 20, the 27 Euro European Union member states um, to mark that uh, went to the Vatican to mark the 1957 Treaty of Rome. So the Treaty of Rome really kicked off the EU in 1957, uh, and last year they celebrated the 60th birthday of that. Now it's again the Pope's influence over them um, is a little bit. Not many, too many of those countries would treat themselves as being particularly religious, but he certainly does have a moral sway uh, over a lot of European countries, of Western European countries particularly. Um, Theresa May, interestingly, didn't go to that um, meeting um, as they're sort of edging their way back out of the European Union. But the Pope uh, at that time warned that the boom in anti-EU parties across Europe, so obviously Britain voted to get out of the European Union. But there's lots of other countries who are sort of stirring up nationalism uh, across Europe as well. So saying, you know, we'll just take care of ourselves, not interested in uh, being involved in a, a pan-European power. Um, but he, the, the Pope's, in, it's really in his best interest to uh, hold the European Union together because that's where he can have some influence. He's not going to have so much influence if each of these nations separate on their own. So it's clearly in the papacy's best interest, and they're working pretty hard behind the scenes to promote further EU um, unity. And that's really one area in which the Pope can wield political power. Um, obviously, the EU began sort of with the Treaty of Rome in Rome, and the Vatican sort of sees itself as the custodian of that agreement. So they're particularly keen to keep it all together um, and keep their influence over that going. And so we can see. Um, the idea of them sitting astride that beast of Revelation chapter 16 and 17, um, sort of coming together through this. So there we have uh, the Pope and, and uh, Putin catching up. And only a few years back we might have scoffed at the idea of the, the Russian leadership and the church uh, getting too cosy together. We had Russia who was nominally you know, communist and atheist. But of course, Putin now finds that um, Orthodox Christianity mixes right in with his sort of version of socialism, which is really just nationalism. Um, so having visited the Pope, that makes him look, look pretty good. Um, and it appeals to um, the nationalism with the Russian Orthodox Church as well, because obviously the Pope and the Orthodox Church are uh, getting on pretty well these days too. Now this photo is from a meeting in, uh, back in 2015 um, and the uh, article said that uh, for, for Putin a visible relationship with the Vatican is an opportunity to highlight Russia's efforts to portray itself as a bulwark of morality and traditional values in contrast to an increasingly secularised Europe. So whereas Europe is moving sort of to the left morally uh, as far as you know, gay rights and all those sort of things are concerned. Russia, on the other hand, is swinging the other way um, and sees themselves as the upholders of Christian values and morals. Um, and so, of course, being seen with the Pope and upholding those same values is, is a good press for, for Putin. So uh, the article also said that Russian conservatives have even resurrected Tsarist rhetoric of Moscow as the third Rome. So that's an interesting uh, idea uh, for us who are familiar with the book of Revelation and of Daniel. So we've got Rome as the first Rome, Constantinople as the second, and then um, Moscow as the third Rome. And sort of the, the seat of the beast moving across uh, Europe there. And the Pope and Putin met then in 2015 and they met again in 2017. Um, and um, it's an interesting to watch that relationship uh, work itself out. Now, is Putin the Gog? Well, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Um, but we suspect that the Gog will be someone very similar to him. Uh, a cunning person, an expansionist, ruthless as. Um, and we expect it to be someone very much like uh, Putin. Is this Pope going to be the Pope who's in charge of the church when sort of Revelation 16 and 17 come to, comes to its fulfilment? Well, maybe he will be, maybe he won't be but it's going to be someone similar to him. 
Um, and depending on whose writings you believe, this Pope has always been uh, supremely ambitious and a very political person, less religious and more political. Um, and that's becoming more and more apparent in the way he works. So we can see these ties between uh, Russia and the Vatican sort of getting closer as well. What about Russia and uh, Iran? Well, obviously the relationship between the US and Iran is uh, coming apart at the seams. So um, before um, Obama came along, um, uh, they put sanctions on Iran to stop them developing nuclear weapons. And yet only very recently the United States said it's going to, um, and then under Obama they lifted the sanctions under the you know, supposition that uh, Iran was going to stop um, its development of these nuclear weapons. Well, only recently, of course, Donald Trump has said, well, we're going to you know, do away with that agreement and we're going to reimpose economic sanctions on Iran. So that's really put a big gap between um, the US um, and Iran. And in many ways, it's forced Iran towards uh, getting closer to Europe and Russia specifically. So um, an article from the New York Times said that by restoring the sanctions, the United States is effectively forcing its allies to go along with the penalty. So it's pressuring uh, any country that has any dealings with Iran, um, threatening them with, with sanctions as well, and saying, if you deal with Iran, then we're not going to uh, buy your goods and services uh, either. So that forces the Europeans to all say, well, you know, we want to support Iran, but America's market's much bigger, so we'll probably go there. And I think um, companies like Mercedes-Benz, for example, have already pulled out of Iran um, because they don't want to get hit by sanctions from the US. But what's the likely effect of this? Well, uh, it's really going to just push Iran closer to Russia, and um, who's also, of course, suffering under um, some US sanctions at the moment. And that pressure is just going to get heavier to move them towards Russia and away from the uh, camp of Britain or the US um, uh, in the, you know, the Western Alliance. So again, very recently, only in, um, in July, uh, Russia said, according to a Financial Times article, that they're re ready to invest $50 billion in Iran's energy industry. So as our US is drawing away from Iran, Russia's getting much closer with it, as we'd expect to see uh, with Roche and Persia, uh, per Ezekiel 38. So from this article in the Financial Times, it said Russia's ready to invest $50 billion in Iran's oil and gas sector, and that $50 billion would go a long way in Iran, given how uh, depressed their economy is. Um, according to a senior advisor to Iran's supreme leader. And he said uh, during a visit to Moscow that was only a couple of weeks ago, uh, including a meeting with uh, President Vladimir Putin, military and technological cooperation of, with Russia is of a major importance to Iran as well. So a suggestion of deeper cooperation, again, on a basis of energy, um, and their energy industries, um, and it looks like Russia's going to go ahead with investing all this money in Iran um, and, of course, um, pumping up their industry and driving them closer together. So ties between Russia and Iran haven't been that strong in the past, but they're about to get a lot stronger. And we can see Tarshish and the Young Lions moving away from Iran and Russia, Rosh, Gog and Magog moving closer to Iran, exactly as we would expect to see from Ezekiel 38. So at the same time that Russian influence is growing in that area, Western <coughs> influence is uh, diminishing. And of course, the USA has had their uh, keenness for wars in the Middle East sub substantially diminished uh, by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that they thought they could sort of waltz in and take over and it didn't sort of work out that way. So they have, over the last uh, 10 years or so, gradually been withdrawing troops out of these areas. And in fact, a gradual reduction of interest by the US in overseas affairs generally. So much more looking inward and much more, much less looking outward. And that began under Obama, uh, who reduced troops in both uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. 
and it's certainly continued under Donald Trump as well. So USA over the last 10 years or so has become much less interventionist, much less willing to put troops on the ground, um, contrast to what they used to do after World War II where they saw themselves as sort of the world police. Um, they're certainly pulling back on that uh, philosophy much more lately. Um, uh, ABC article from April um, in 2018 said uh, the decline of the American dominance in the Middle East may be very gradual, but it is a decline nonetheless. The US will not disappear from the region as it still has interests to defend, but the stiff prop it once provided to the old system of rule in the Middle East, all those you know, shakedoms and all those sort of things, um, will continue to, to bow, especially as the weight on it increases. So um, that Iran uh, deal that Obama struck to um, you know, lift sanctions on Iran and um, as, as long as they stopped developing nuclear weapons really put the USA offside with a lot of their allies in the Middle East. So the Saudi Arabians were very suspicious about that deal uh, and of course Israel as well. Um, and now that Trump's going back on that deal, that's you know, seen as a positive thing by Saudi Arabia and Israel. So once again, the idea of Sheba and Dedan um, heading back into the camp of Tarshish and the Young Lions. So that's exactly the direction we would expect to see it in. So Western influence in those areas is, is diminishing and perhaps the idea that they'll only put up a small resistance to the Russian-led invasion seems to be more likely. What's going to be the excuse that brings Russia into Jerusalem in the uh, longer term? Well, one of the reasons they used to come down into Syria was that they were fighting a holy war. So this is from back in 2015 when they first launched uh, airstrikes in Syria. Um, and the Orthodox Church said that Russia was fighting a holy battle in Syria. So uh, basically the church, the Russian Orthodox Church was saying that, you know, good on Putin for sending uh, aeroplanes and troops down there because it's a holy war to protect the innocents against the tyranny of terrorism. And by that they mean protecting the Christian Syrians from the uh, Muslim Syrians basically. So Russia sees itself as the protector of these Christians all around the world, but particularly uh, at the moment in Syria, um, it sees itself as protecting the Christians uh, from the um, influence and, and the, you know, the t uh, terrorism, I guess as they see it, of the Muslims down there. So um, there, uh, another report said that the strategists in Kremlin are probably not donning the vestments of crusaders right now, but it's definitely a, an influence in their decision making. So they see themselves as the protectors of many of the Orthodox Church's uh, properties in the Middle East as well, and particularly of course in the area of Jerusalem uh, and Israel generally. So perhaps Russia will paint its future move as a protective move. We're going down to protect uh, either the Christians in that area, um, the Orthodox Christians particularly, or perhaps protect the real estate that's owned by the church uh, in the Holy Land. And that's definitely an excuse they've used to move into Syria. So we talked about the fact that the EU and Britain are sort of moving apart. So they had that, um, that uh, vote over Brexit. which sort of surprised everyone that it came out that the Britain would move away from the EU. And now they've spent the last two years trying to decide exactly how that's going to happen. And that's proved to be quite tricky, uh, to put it mildly. So obviously Britain doesn't want to give up the sort of free trade agreements that they've got with the EU. They're, they're all for that, but they don't want the free, free movement of people. So they don't want all the immigrants coming in from Europe into Britain. Um, but obviously the EU saying we can't have it both ways. So they're trying to compromise on both of these areas, um, <clears throat> but it's obviously proving to be quite a tricky task to keep everyone happy or keep everyone less unhappy than they would otherwise have been. So the world was pretty amazed when Britain voted for the Brexit from the EU, 
um, a couple of years ago, but now a lot of voters obviously are realising, well, perhaps we didn't do the right thing, perhaps we didn't vote in the best national interest, um, and there have been some calls for a second re referendum even. That seems to be pretty unlikely to eventuate because putting Britain through all that angst again seems pretty unlikely. So it's really going to be up to uh, Theresa May to try and work out the best she can of what is obviously a fairly tricky situation for her. Um, but those negotiations are continuing. Um, but as we said, we expect to see Britain um, with at least an independent military um, and definitely sort of independent policies to the rest of the EU. So it came as no surprise to us to see that them pulling out of that common market uh, idea. An interesting one that's happened fairly recently is the idea of um, Turkey. So that's our country of Tagama in, um, in, um, in Ezekiel 38. The idea of them um, and, Russia and the USA falling apart fairly recently. So normally they're allies. Turkey's part of NATO, so they're all sort of should be all chummy with the USA. But that uh, doesn't sort of count for much with Donald Trump, obviously. Um, and we expect to see them sort of in the Russian camp um, come Ezekiel when Ezekiel 38 is fulfilled. Now, whether that happens by force from Russia or they're naturally allied with them, we're not too sure. But um, this sort of is certainly driving a big wedge between them. So how did this come about? Uh, some of you might know about it. but. Um, We've got two basic uh, megalomaniacs going head to head here. We've got Erdogan in, in Turkey, who's a dictator and sort of really entrenching himself in power there. And of course, we've got Donald Trump in the USA. Um, and they're going head to head. Um, and the result basically at the moment is that Turkey's economy is going into free fall. Um, inflation skyrocketing there and their uh, lira, the Turkish lira is really plummeting in value and a wedge is being driven between the two countries. How did that come about? Well, it's because uh, Erdogan has been really keen to establish his dictatorship, and one of his previous political opponents, um, Fatula Gulen, uh, is living in the USA, and um, the Turks want him handed over. They want him back in Turkey to face charges, presumably death, really, um, and the USA is refusing to hand this guy over. So what did Turkey do? Well, they responded by arresting a, uh, an American Christian pastor in Turkey, and his name is Andrew Brunson, um, along with 50,000 other Turkish people, but no one's particularly interested in them. But they've arrested this one American pastor, and they're keeping him and saying, well, he was part of the coup, uh, attempted coup against Erdogan. Uh, so the Americans, in turn, said, well, we're going to slap tariffs on all the Turkish steel and aluminium, so and they did this only a, a week or two ago. Oh, sorry, they did that a little while ago, and a week or two ago they threatened to double those tariffs. So steel and aluminium are big exports for Turkey, and, uh, and the US has slapped uh, tariffs on them and threatened to double those tariffs um, to try and get this uh, Christian pastor, um, Andrew Brunson, uh, released from uh, house arrest in Turkey. So Erdogan responded to that by putting tariffs on US produce, uh, cars and other products, and they've had mass demonstrations on the street of people smashing iPhones and all that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so we've got this economic battle, and Turkey's coming off, of, as you'd expect, much worse than the USA. Um, one's a very small country and one's quite a large one. So the outcome is as you'd expect. But one little talked about issue is also that Turkey threatened to buy, um, being a NATO country, ally, allied militarily with the US, but they threatened to buy military supplies from Russia instead of the USA. Um, so that really got the Americans excited as well in a bad way. Um, so further evidence that they're really heading away from the you know, sort of Tarshish camp in Ezekiel 38 and heading towards the Gog camp as we'd expect to see, and that sort of situation is really unfolding in front of us. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see that, uh, how that goes. And another worry for Turkey is oil. They're, they're a net importer of oil. They're not like all those rich, oil-rich um, 
Middle Eastern countries around them. Um, and of course, that's traded in dollars. Oil is priced in dollars, and their plummeting lira is making everything really expensive for the Turks. So that's just a few of the areas that we're interested to keep an eye on um, that are happening sort of as we speak, literally some of these things, particularly this Turkish one's an interesting one that's carrying on uh, as we speak. Um, and there's lots of other areas we could have looked at. What's happening in Israel at the moment, we didn't even really, haven't even really touched on that. Um, what's happening morally in the world, environmentally in the world, we haven't touched on any of those things. But there's plenty going on that we can uh, keep an eye on as we anticipate Ezekiel 38 coming to pass. Now it might seem all doom and gloom, Ezekiel 38 doesn't seem a really positive chapter, you know, sort of talking about war and destruction, but it does wind up on a positive note. And it's really for this reason that we can um, lift up our heads, seeing these things coming to pass, uh, and look forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And particularly verse 23 of Ezekiel 38. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, says God, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So it's not all doom and gloom. Because of these events that we can see uh, taking place, we can see God's intervention directly uh, coming shortly, and that will lead to the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. And so we pray with John in Revelation, even so come, Lord Jesus.